Okay. okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Bastiat Society of Washington, D.C. luncheon event. Uh, my name is Steve Dewey. I'm the chapter director of our Washington, D.C. Uh, chapter. For those of you not familiar with the Bastiat Society, it is the public outreach program of the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known as AIER. The purpose of the Bastiat Society is to provide a forum for advancing the ideals of free market economics and sound money, property rights, personal liberty, and a free and civil society. The Boston Society has 40 chapters around the world, with 16 chapters here in the United States and 24 chapters in foreign countries. If you'd like to learn more about AIER and the Boston Society, our website address is AIER.org. Today I'm very excited to have Richard Samp as our featured speaker. Uh, Mr. Samp is Senior Litigation Counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance in Washington, D.C. He will discuss how the administrative state threatens the constitutional rights of American citizens and businesses. This discussion will include the New Civil Liberty Liberties Alliance's litigation efforts to challenge the unlawful power of federal and state agencies that comprise the administrative state. We've also uh, discussed the outlook for a new civil liberties movement to restore Americans' fundamental rights under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, a brief summary of our speaker's background, Mr. Tam has over 40 years of experience in private law practice in Washington, D.C., specializing in appellate litigation with a focus on constitutional law. He served as chief counsel of the Washington Legal Foundation for more than 30 years and has participated in more than 200 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Samp is a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan Law School. So for our, our discussion today, we have scheduled it to be for about an hour until 1.30. Our future speaker's presentation will be for about 30 minutes, which will allow plenty of time for a QA session with attendees. So now I will turn it over to our future speaker, Richard Samp. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, I really do hope this is, a, to some extent, an interactive discussion. I have uh, some thoughts of my own about uh, the best way to be taking on the administrative state. But I'm a litigator who is always open to uh, new ideas. So I certainly encourage any ideas that any of you have for the sorts of cases that my group, the, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, might want to take on. Uh, just a little bit about the group. Uh, uh, Professor Hamburger from uh, Columbia Law School has been a, uh, a, a principal opponent of the expansion of the administrative state. He wrote a, a, a well-received uh, book several years ago called uh, Is, the, uh, uh, Is Administrative Law Illegal? And uh, his answer to that is essentially yes. And uh, he, uh, uh, as a result, he, he parlayed that into starting up this organization, which now has about 12 litigators. And uh, the, the problem that we see it is not that there are lots of evil people in the government who are trying to do wrong. The problem is that we are getting away from the idea that the founders had to have three separate branches of government. The uh, founders well understood that everybody is going to be acting in their own self-interest when they are in the government. And yeah. the one way to uh, control that is to have faction opposing faction. And uh, if you have a, a strong judiciary, a strong legislative branch, and a strong executive branch, that they will naturally balance each other out and they will uh, make sure that there are not major abuses of power. Uh, and that worked very well for the first perhaps 100 
20 years or so in this country, when in the progressive era, particularly, I think mean, Woodrow Wilson was perhaps the most uh, the strongest uh, adherent to the administrative state, the idea began to take hold that the problem with government was it didn't have enough power and that there were two, the private interests were too powerful that you had big uh, trusts out there and that the government couldn't control uh, uh, the economy in the public interest. And so the answer to that was to strengthen uh, the executive branch in particular to build up the, uh, 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 the federal bureaucracy as a way of having a power structure that could take on uh, a private industry. And occasionally you hear the argument that, well, you know, it was okay back in, in colonial times to uh, uh, have three separate branches of government, but then uh, really uh, you need full-time bureaucrats because government is just too big and complicated to be able to, to uh, uh, do the kinds of things that the modern state has to deal with. And that just simply, I think, hasn't proven true. I think perhaps the best example of the ability of Congress, if it wants to, to write very detailed rules is the tax code. If you've ever seen the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Code, it's thousands of pages long, and it's got all the detailed rules you could possibly want, and, and more than that, uh, for how, how to fill out your taxes. And uh, so, so Congress is quite able to, to write the laws, which it's supposed to be doing if it wants to. And courts are quite able, if they want to, to interpret the law. And in fact, that is their job. Uh, the uh, uh, famous Supreme Court case of Marbury versus Madison, uh, that Chief Justice Marshall uh, uh, famously said that it is the uh, uh, duty of uh, courts to say what the law is, and that has been uh, the general rule. But but more and more, uh, the bureaucracy has built up various uh, uh, games or rules that they employ uh, to try to claim that they have more power than the other branches. And uh, uh, so, one of the the principal goals of the New Civil Liberties Alliance and other groups that are doing similar things to us is to try to cut back on some of those rules because we think that uh, restoring three branches of government to uh, uh, equal strength uh, uh, will go a long way towards improving uh, civil liberties in this country. Uh, and so uh, I, in this uh, uh, presentation here, we've uh, uh, just simply uh, tried to illustrate some of the games that the bureaucrats play by uh, comparing them to some of uh, the more popular board games around. And one way that, uh, uh, perhaps the, the strongest way that the bureaucracy kind of twists the law is under a doctrine called Chevron deference. And all of these doctrines I'm really telling you about all just derive their name from uh, Supreme Court cases that uh, have uh, upheld these various rules. And under Chevron deference, the idea is that, well, Congress writes laws and sometimes uh, they don't fully answer all of the uh, questions as to precisely what the law means. So the, the best way to resolve that is to uh, set up uh, federal agencies whose job it is to interpret these laws. And once the uh, bureaucrats uh, interpret the law, then under uh, what's known as Chevron deference, uh, the courts are supposed to defer to what the uh, uh, bureaucrats have said so that uh, uh, they may think, the courts may think, that uh, the law really means uh, one thing, but if, if in their mind the, the law is a little bit unclear and the, the uh, federal agency has said it means something else, well then under Chevron deference, uh, you ought to defer to what the bureaucrats say. And for very highly technical subjects, of course it makes sense to assume that uh, the Food and Drug Administration knows more about the, uh, uh, the way that particular drugs work than the courts do. So, so on, on technical issues, it makes sense to, to uh, say, well, somebody else really does know better than 
we do. But when it comes to interpreting federal statutes, there's really nobody who does that better than courts do. And so one of the things that we have been working very hard to do is to convince the courts uh, to cut back on Chevron difference. And in fact, just to give you a couple of examples, we've got a couple of cases that are right now before the U.S. Supreme Court on that issue. Uh, you may be aware of something called bump stocks, which are, are uh, things that you can put on to semi-automatic rifles that uh, help them to uh, shoot more quickly. And uh, for many years, the uh, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms said, you know, these products uh, are legal. But then uh, there were some uh, incidents, particularly one in Las Vegas, where uh, there were mass killings, and advocates of gun control said, well, Congress ought to pass a law to uh, uh, eliminate these bump stocks because they, they make these automatic rifles too much like machine guns. Well, Congress never passed such a law, so ATF said, well, that's no problem for us. We'll change the law. They uh, had, for many years, had regulation that said that, uh, 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 that these bump stocks were not machine guns because machine guns are, under federal law, are illegal. Uh, but uh, in 2018, uh, ATF passed a new regulation and said, oops, we, we made a mistake before. The, the best interpretation is to say that, uh, uh, that bump stocks really are machine guns. Uh, and uh, so we have challenged that in the courts. Uh, we brought a challenge in the U.S. Court of Appeals in Denver and we lost that case six to five. We brought a challenge in the U.S. Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, and we originally won that case in front of a panel, but uh, uh, the court agreed to hear the case on bunk, and then they tied eight to eight. Uh, and uh, so the result of the tie was to leave ATF's rule in place. And we've also got a case that is still pending in front of the U.S. Court of Appeals in New Orleans. So we have asked the Supreme Court to, uh, in the case out of the Tenth Circuit, uh, as well as the case out of the Sixth Circuit, those are the Denver and the Cincinnati courts, uh, to hear the case and to say Chevron deference should not apply in this situation, and particularly should not apply because, after all, this is a criminal statute. And the general rule is that if a criminal statute is ambiguous, Courts are supposed to uh, lean on the side of lenity and uh, say that uh, someone has not committed a crime, that if Congress wants to create a crime, it ought to do so explicitly. And when it is somewhat vague like this, you ought not to have a, uh, a uh, uh, agency declaring a new criminal law. Uh, so we are waiting in the next couple of months to find out whether the Supreme Court agrees to hear that case. Another case we have involves a, a, a veteran who uh, is seeking disability benefits. And in fact, he was awarded disability benefits. He was considered partially disabled for hearing loss, and he was honorably discharged from the uh, Air Force back in about 2000. Um, and then he was called up to active duty in the reserves in about 2003 or 4 during the Gulf War. And he served for about a year or so. Well, under federal law, you can't double dip, so you can't get both your disability benefits and your active duty pay. So he said, fine, I'll, I'll let the VA know that I'm getting uh, my uh, active duty pay. So he was cut off from his disability benefits for about a year and a half. And then he left active service in 2005, but he just didn't get around to about 2009 in uh, saying, oops, yeah, I guess I better get those disability benefits resumed. And the government said, okay, yeah, you're still disabled, but uh, you, you, you're too late. You, for those last four years, between 2005 and 2009, even though all the law says is you can't double dip, doesn't say anything about having to uh, um, sign up again uh, for something you're already entitled to, he lost four years in benefits. So our argument there is even though VA has this rule that says, you don't resume your benefits until you ask for them. That's not what the federal law says. So we're asking uh, that uh, he be entitled to his benefits. Well, the, the court that heard the case, the, the what's called the federal circuit here in uh, Washington, said 
well, we think the rule's kind of ambiguous, so we're going to defer to what uh, the, uh, uh, the VA said, and he loses his four years of benefits. Well, we are saying, now wait a second, the general rule is under something called the uh, uh, veteran's preference, or, or sometimes called the veteran's canon, ambiguous statutes, they're always supposed to be interpreted in favor of the veteran. So we're asking the Supreme Court to say that Chevron should not apply in this instance. And we're also going for broke in this case. We're saying, oh, and question number two, should you overrule Chevron altogether? So that case is coming up in the next couple of months. And the Supreme Court, we don't know whether they will agree to hear that one. Uh, a, a issue that's very related to uh, uh, Chevron deference uh, is something called our deference. Our A-U-E-R is another uh, Supreme Court case that said that if you have ambiguous regulations of a uh, federal agency, uh, again, the courts ought to defer to the interpretation of that, uh, uh, of that ambiguous regulation. Uh, and uh, so that if the agency says, well, you know, we would didn't weren't clear the first time, but we've now changed our mind, and this is what the, the regulation really means. The courts aren't allowed to, to read the actual words of the regulation. They're supposed to defer. Well, we have been challenging that, and in fact, we were involved in a case two years ago, in a case called Gundy in the Supreme Court, in which it made it very clear that it's on the verge of totally overruling our deference uh, and saying it makes no sense uh, to not allow the courts to be the ones to interpret the words of a regulation. Uh, and so I'm suspecting that this particular rule may get overruled in the next year or two, uh, although there's no case in the Supreme Court on that issue right now. The reason why our deference makes no sense is all it does is it encourages agencies to write vague regulations so that then that way they have the option to say the regulation means whatever they want uh, at the time that they actually have to apply it. The, uh, uh, in order to have a regulation that means something that is, uh, that is actually has the force of law, an agency has to go through formal, what's called notice and comment rulemaking. They have to uh, uh, say that here's what we intend to, to include in the regulation and, and people have an opportunity to to uh, comment, and then the agency can't finally adopt the regulation until they have responded to every one of those comments. Well, agencies don't like that process. It's too cumbersome. So the way you get around it is you, you write these vague regulations, and then you, you try to apply them later. So um, our deference is another one of the rules that agencies use. Courts shouldn't let them get away with it. Courts ought to be the ones uh, who uh, stand up and say, Here's what a regulation means, because we can read the words as well as, as the agency can. Uh, a variant of, uh, of uh, Chevron deference is something called brand X deference. And this is uh, particularly pernicious, uh, because uh, if the uh, courts have before them a case involving the interpretation of a statute, and they interpret it one way, then agencies come in and they write a regulation and they say, oh, we interpret it differently. We want to overrule the courts. And, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a case called Brand X, the Supreme Court said, well, that's OK. Uh, the, the, even though the courts came up with one interpretation, so long as there's some doubt about the meaning of the statute, uh, they can be overruled by by agency. That makes absolutely no sense. Uh, that that courts who are interpreting statutes can be can say one thing and then be later overruled by uh, the, uh, 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 the the federal agency that is administering the law. So that is one. Our group doesn't have any cases under Brand X right now. But there are a number of challenges to that doctrine that are going on right now. Uh, another variant of uh, uh, Chevron deference is uh, sometimes referred to as City of Arlington deference. And this is a particularly pernicious form of Chevron deference because uh, 
courts, it's one thing to say courts have the right to interpret what a regulation means uh, when they clearly have jurisdiction over a particular area. But uh, in the city of Arlington case, uh, what the courts said was, oh, they also get deference when the question is, how much jurisdiction does the uh, agency have? Uh, the, the, uh, that particular case involved the jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, the FCC decided, oh, we've never before regulated the, the uh, uh, rights of cities to uh, enforce their zoning laws with respect to where cell towers can be placed. But um, uh, we now have decided that we have jurisdiction to uh, do that. And uh, the Supreme Court said, well, OK, well, they, they've um, uh, chosen to exercise that deference. We need to, to uh, de defer to, to their views as to how much power they have. And, um, uh, and that was uh, that allowed for expansion of FCC's power considerably. Uh, luckily, one of the strongest dissenters in that case was Chief Justice Roberts, and he has never given up, given up on that dissent. And uh, so, again, this is an area where uh, the Supreme Court may well cut back on, on the Stephens Doctrine. Uh, another area that's a uh, real problem, this is not a, a deference doctrine, but this has to do with the right of of uh, agencies to basically have their own courts. Now, it's one thing to say that uh, the Department of uh, HHS has the right to uh, have a hearing to decide whether an individual is entitled to disability benefits under SSI, for example. I mean, that makes sense. They are giving out benefits and they get to uh, uh, have hearings, which you can later appeal to the courts, but. But, but that kind of administrative hearing makes sense. But on the other hand, there are a number of agencies, such as the Federal Trade Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission, which conduct their own hearings where they bring enforcement actions against people and impose large fines, and they prohibit people for, for the rest of their lives from being involved, say, in the securities industry. Uh, and those sorts of actions traditionally were done in the courts. Well, Places, the groups like the SEC decided, you know, we're losing too often in the courts. That, that's no fun. We would just assume like to win all the time. So instead of going into court to bring enforcement actions, more and more, they have bring enforcement actions in their own administrative courts. Well, those sorts of administrative hearings run headlong into various uh, constitutional provisions, I think most prominently the Seventh Amendment, which gives everybody a right uh, in a uh, civil matter to a jury trial. Well, none of these uh, administrative hearings uh, call for uh, uh, for any jury trial rights. Instead, you, you uh, have a uh, proceeding in front of an employee of the agency, and these particular employees tend to rule 100% in favor of, uh, of their own agency. So entirely a fair hearing. Uh, so we have uh, been involved in cases, uh, including one pending right now in the U.S. Court of Appeals in New Orleans, uh, which challenges uh, these sorts of SEC proceedings, uh, particularly because the SEC always has the option. They can go into court to enforce the law, uh, in which case there could be a jury trial, or they can do it in front of their own administrative agency, uh, in front of an ALJ, in which case there's there's no jury trial. So they have a right to, have it, to decide to have a jury or not have a jury. But you know, that same right doesn't belong to the individual who is being charged in the enforcement action. If, if the SEC goes uh, uh, for an administrative hearing, there is no jury whatsoever. So we are arguing in the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals in uh, uh, New Orleans that that is a violation of the right to a jury trial. Where we're expecting a, a decision soon. There's a case called Atlas Roofing that was mentioned here on the slide that was decided by the Supreme Court back in the 1970s that said they didn't really see a problem with uh, not having a jury trial, right? But there have been some later decisions by the Supreme Court that 
had suggested that the court take second thoughts on that issue. So I think that there is a real prospect of getting rid of some of these administrative trials. Uh, another major area that we've worked on is something called the non-delegation doctrine. Now, Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution says that the uh, power to uh, uh, write laws is vested solely in Congress, and that Congress doesn't have the right to uh, uh, delegate that power to anybody else. However, that doctrine has been, and, and the Supreme Court has recognized that that really is a provision of the Constitution that needs to be enforced, but it has been watered down in recent years. And so what the courts have said in recent decades is that so long as the uh, uh, Congress comes up with an intelligible principle to guide the work of the, uh, uh, of the agency, they haven't really been delegating their power to uh, the agency, and therefore it doesn't violate Article 1, Section 1 of the Constitution. The problem then becomes that, that uh, the intelligible principle doctrine has been so watered down that if Congress says, for example, uh, that uh, we hereby authorize the uh, FCC to regulate the airwaves in the public interest, well, Public interest somehow becomes an intelligible principle, and you can, uh, uh, if that is an intelligible principle, there really are very few of any limits on uh, uh, this particular uh, constitutional thing. Uh, the Supreme Court, several years ago, in one of its decisions, made clear that it was thinking of at least somewhat revitalizing the non delegation. And so we are involved in two cases that are currently pending in the Supreme Court that, uh, that arguably will uh, allow the court to put new life back into the non-delegation doctrine. One is a, a, a EPA regulation case by the name of uh, West Virginia versus EPA. And the other one is a case uh, coming up under the um, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a law which allows uh, uh, federal agencies to essentially delegate to uh, uh, private Indian tribes the right to write rules for how uh, uh, children who are at least partially of Indian ancestry are to be adopted. So that even if a child, for example, has been brought up by foster parents um, by, for several years, if those foster parents are not uh, uh, members of, of a particular Indian tribe, the Indian tribe can say, oh, no, we, we think when it comes to time for permanent adoption that uh, uh, the child ought to be adopted by an Indian family. Uh, the, one of the issues in the case is whether or not uh, uh, the uh, Congress has improperly delegated powers. I think the correct side is going to win both of those cases. I think, unfortunately, it, it's probably going to our side is going to win those cases on other issues. So I'm, I'm afraid the Supreme Court is not going to uh, tackle the non-delegation doctrine in these particular cases, even though they have the opportunity to do so. Uh, but that is another issue I think that uh, uh, really needs to be addressed. Another problem of what the federal agencies uh, engage in a practice called unconstitutional conditions, and this is not just actually agencies that do this, Congress does this as well, where uh, they set up a regulatory scheme and uh, people want to engage in, in business, um, and normally they would have a right to do so, except for this particular regulatory scheme, and, and uh, the agency or Congress says, no problem, you can go ahead and do it, but in return, you have to uh, agree to forfeit certain constitutional rights. This comes up in the context of uh, property rights. If you're a developer, oh, well, you have to turn over certain land to the government and maybe we'll give you uh, uh, the uh, right to develop your property, or you'll have to perhaps forfeit your First Amendment rights. Uh, and under what's known as the, the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, the government is not supposed to be uh, engaging that kind of rulemaking. 
this came up in the uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court challenge to Obamacare a number of years ago. Um, the, the Obamacare was generally upheld, but one of the provisions of that law uh, basically said to the states that, uh, okay, if you want it, you've been getting all of this Medicare money for years. Well, if you want to continue to get this money, uh, um, you have to uh, uh, apply, comply with the following conditions in terms of expanding your uh, uh, state uh, Medicare programs and Medicaid programs. And the Supreme Court said, no, under the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, you can't do that. You have to. You, you, uh, the federal government can't coerce uh, the states in that uh, way. And, and so the result of that Obamacare decision, I think that uh, there has been real life put back into the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, and, and we are continuing to, to litigate that issue. Uh, one issue that has been a real problem of, of late is basically cancel culture and trying to take away people's First Amendment rights um, as a lawyer, I have a particular interest in uh, efforts to suppress speech by lawyers. Somehow, well, uh, 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 bureaucrats will tell you that the lawyers have a special obligation to uh, uh, control their speech so as not to offend anybody. And uh, many states around the country have adopted a rule which is basically a speech code for lawyers. And they are not allowed to say anything uh, that could be deemed derogatory towards about 15 particular protected groups, uh, including uh, people who are um, uh, members of identifiable racial group or, or comments about sex or sexual preference or um, um, you know the long list that, that can get included here. We have filed a lawsuit in the state of Connecticut challenging uh, Connecticut's speech uh, code for lawyers uh, arguing that uh, um, this is a violation of First Amendment rights, and in particular, it's what's known as a content-based uh, uh, speech regulation. And those kinds of speech regulations are particularly suspect. It's one thing to say, okay, no loud noise uh, in the park on Sunday mornings because nearby residents might be uh, uh, bothered. Those sorts of of speech regulations are content neutral and those are fine, but when you start saying uh, lawyers can't say anything about certain subjects for fear of losing their law license, that is a serious First Amendment problem. And so um, we are hopeful to, well, in that case, there is another case brought by another organization that is that recently won an injunction against the similar rule in the state of Pennsylvania. So we are, we are hopeful about that particular case. Uh, another problem is something called guidances. All the time, agencies will tell you that uh, 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 we're issuing what we call our guidance, meaning this is our current view as to what the uh, uh, law means. Uh, and if you, therefore, you do X, you could go to jail for 10 years. So we're not saying that this is a formal rule. So it's not binding, and of course, one of the advantages to the agency of saying that is you can't challenge it in court. You just have to wait, to, you know, if you have to take a risk, do what we say is a violation of the law, and then you can defend yourself in the criminal proceedings, but you, know, you may end up in jail for 10 years, but, but that's just the, the, the luck of the draw. Well, the problem with guidance documents is that they really are an end round, an end run around the notice and comment procedures that uh, I was talking about earlier. The agencies are supposed to go through elaborate formal notice and comment before issuing regulations. Instead, if you issue a guidance document, there's no need to do that because you, uh, the regulated community generally knows they have no choice but to comply with these guidance documents, and there's no way they can challenge them in court because the agencies say, well, this isn't a final agency action, so uh, you can, uh, uh, you'll just have to, if you want to test it, you'll have to violate the law and see if you end up in jail. So we had been uh, challenging a number of kinds of documents. Actually, during the Trump administration, the government issued an edict that was uh, an 
attempt to cut back on uh, the issuance of guidance documents. But one of the very first things the Biden administration did was to withdraw the executive order issued by the Trump administration. So we're now back to that, that same situation that we had before. Um, I talked earlier about administrative law judges uh, and in-house uh, deciding cases. And of course, all of these administrative law judges are employees of the agency that, uh, um, that has brought the case against an enforcement action. So naturally, if they want to keep their jobs, they uh, uh, need to rule in, front of, in favor of the agency that has brought the enforcement action. And they do pretty much 100% of the time. Now, we have been involved in a couple of challenges to the procedures for ALJs, including one that we won just a couple of weeks ago by a, 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 a nine to seven vote in the Court of Appeals down in New Orleans. Um, because one of the problems was if you thought that the, the proceeding was unfair and not properly structured, what, what the courts had said in the past was you had to go through the entire administrative proceeding, which could take four or five years. And then if you lose in those proceedings, you then go into court and say, you lost because it was an unfair procedure. And if the courts agreed with you, your reward was you got to go back in front of the agency again and go through that, that process for another five years. And, uh, um, and uh, not a whole lot of people want to go through that process. The case that we won in the Court of Appeals, uh, uh, I think, has a real potential to uh, uh, break through that, that uh, administrative maze because it allows people who think that the procedures are illegal to immediately go into federal district court and challenge the illegal procedures. Um, and uh, as I said, we won that case. Uh, it was against the Securities and Exchange Commission. They aren't very happy with it, so they have asked the Supreme Court to uh, review that case. Since there is a clear split of authority, I think it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court will hear that issue in the coming year. But I'm, I'm hopeful that if we win that case, there will then be the right uh, of uh, people to, if they have an unfair proceeding, to challenge it immediately. We had another case that did make it to the Supreme Court a couple of years ago. Uh, and, uh, involving a man named Ray Lucia, and he is kind of a, 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 a real um, a poster child for the problems with the system because he had to go through the entire SEC enforcement process. He lost, he was banned for life from the securities industry. He got to the Supreme Court and he won on his procedural issue. They said, yes, it was not a fair proceeding. And uh, so his reward was he had to go back and get a fair proceeding in front of the uh, SEC, and we were urging him to fight and to say that it was still uh, uh, an unfair proceeding that they were planning. But but uh, he said, you know, I've been fighting this for seven years. They've just offered me a settlement that is a lot less onerous than the first judgment. I've got to settle. So that's one way that these agencies can win their cases. Um, and then just one final um, uh, problem with agencies, and this, this is something that's been going on since the 1930s in a case called Humphrey's Executor, where the uh, uh, Supreme Court upheld what's known as an independent agency. Well, a problem with an independent agency is they're supposed to be part of the executive branch, which means if the president doesn't like what the agency is doing, he ought to have the right to countermand what they're doing. But People like Woodrow Wilson and, and uh, believers in the, in the administrative state thought, no, we need these independent people who, uh, you know, the politicians just muck things up too much. And popular will it can be you know, a very bad thing. So it's better just to allow the experts in Washington to be in charge. So Congress set up a number of these administrative agencies like the uh, uh, SEC and the Federal Trade Commission and a few others. Uh, and they were upheld in a case called uh, Humphrey's Executor. However, we've been involved in a couple of recent cases where Congress went even further with independent agencies. They said, we're setting up these agencies where it wasn't a board that was independent, it was one individual who was in, uh, independent. Uh, so the uh, CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection 
was one such group that had a single uh, head. And there was another group called the FHFA, which is a, a banking regulatory group that had one head. And those that issue came before the Supreme Court, first in a case called Sable Law, having to do with the CFPB, and then in a case called Collins, having to do with the FHFA. And in both cases, the Supreme Court said, well, we're not necessarily going to overrule Humphrey's executor, but we are going to say that this is a step too far, and you can't have an independent agency that just had one individual. At least if you have a group of people, generally whose members are appointed by both political parties, at least you'll have some political responsiveness, but that, that's never going to be the case with an individual head of an agency, so that now the head of the CFPB can be uh, hired and fired by the president. And in the case of the CFPB, that was a real problem for a while, because the head of the CFPB, who was appointed by President Obama, <coughs> refused to resign at the beginning of the Trump administration. He stayed on for about two years, and he said, I'm independent, and I don't have to listen to what the Trump administration was saying. So as a result of the Supreme Court's decision in Sale of Law, that's no longer the case. The CFPB had changes with the president, and so you, know, you, you may not like the policies of the current president with the CFPB, but at least you can know that you can change that by uh, changing administrations in the next election. All right, with that, I've gone on too far. We've got a few more minutes to have questions and answers, so thank you for your attention, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just have a, well, I'm wondering how this um, might apply to what the administrative state does in terms of COVID policies, you know, mass mandates, of course, and, and vaccine mandates. I'm thinking the game monopoly, which I didn't see up there, might apply, or maybe a little bit of what the game is doing, but can you tell me in relation to the games uh, that's being played as far as COVID? Well, a lot of the various games uh, apply to COVID policy, I think in particular, Chevron deference. What you hear from uh, federal health authorities is, we know best uh, what policy should be. Well, then some people respond, yeah, but where does it say in the law that these health uh, officials in Atlanta uh, at the CDC have the right to change housing policy and to say that there can be no housing ev ev evictions during uh, COVID? I mean, is that really part of their bailiwick? And the argument uh, there was, well, you know, we interpret our statute as giving us that power, and you, the courts, ought to uh, defer to us. And some of the lower courts did apply Chevron deference and defer, and the case got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, the CDC is in charge of health policy. And the idea that somehow cutting back on evictions of tenants who haven't paid their rent is really going to make a major difference in, in health uh, policy it doesn't follow, and that's not within their bailiwick. So yes, it very much applies to what has gone on during COVID. Yes? Yeah, on the, the way that I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> on on um, censoring the president of the United States, as big tech companies have done, again, this is not a government agency, this is an independent business, but how is it that that's allowed, and does it fall under any of these, or is this a whole different category of, of legal issues? It is a different category of legal issues. I mean, there is some, if you really had a monopoly, so if you only, if you had only one telephone company, for example, they were thought of as a common carrier, so that in effect, they had a government-imposed monopoly, and therefore they would come to the government actor, and so their speech could be regulated. There are a lot of social media companies out there. I, I understand that there is differences of opinion about uh, how much regulation there ought to be of what Twitter can do and not do. Uh, but my general sense is that if you don't like Twitter's policy, use another uh, uh, social media platform. I think the problem arises, though, because I get the very strong impression that some of these social media companies feel as though 
they have to do the government's bidding, that they will get in trouble with the government unless they uh, do more to censor speech. And so to the extent that they are doing the government bidding, they then do become government actors. And to that extent, you know, uh, they, uh, they would be subject to regulation. And in fact, there's a case going on in Texas right now, because Texas has adopted a law that adopts that theory and, and says, as far as we're concerned, some of these social uh, media companies are, are common carriers and, and ought to be uh, allowing um, all speakers to speak. As I said, I've got kind of mixed feelings on that subject. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation. It's great to see you again. Uh, so, one of the things that uh, I always struggle with when it comes to the deep state, the, you know, the bottomless bureaucracies, uh, is there's no, there's no one person to punish uh, for any of these bad behaviors, right? So, I mean, they already have taxpayer dollars to fund endless legal battles. So even if we win, they can just do it a little differently, but really change nothing. And so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious what you think we can, uh, you know, how do you think we can sort of put a dent in this? Because like the problem, as I see with bureaucracies, is that they don't always necessarily have like, a leader. It's really just self-interest. About keeping the job, uh, and so there's not always uh, like a, a clear organizational instrument behind the scenes pulling the strings. It's really more so they're just uh, scope creep uh, and bottomless funding. So I mean, how do we how do we prevent this? Not just fight it, but prevent it. Well, I agree with you. This is not an easy problem that's going to get solved overnight. I do have hopes that if we can revitalize the non-delegation doctrine, that that would make a difference. I think the problem with Congress is their number one goal is not to adopt any particular piece of legislation. Their number one goal is to get reelected, and that, that's true for all members of Congress. And so they would, they'll pass legislation where they can then go back to their constituents and say, you see, we've addressed problems of uh, environmental pollution by passing this law, but the law will be written very vaguely and delegate to uh, the EPA or somebody else the authority to carry out the law. So they can then say to their constituents, isn't it terrible what they're doing there in Washington? And I'm, I'm fighting those terrible bureaucrats on your behalf. Well, the problem is that the law that they wrote in the first place and the agency, and you're right, those, most people would have no ability to identify the particular bureaucrat who wrote the regulation to which they object. So there's no way to make that person politically accountable. So you really need to put decision making into the hands of those people who are accountable. So that Congress, if it uh, is required to actually write the law rather than writing pieces of legislation that are just feel good, pass the buck sort of uh, legislation, uh, then uh, you will have the ability to say, well, Congressman Smith, you you voted for this law, and this law is the thing that's giving me heartache, and I'm going to vote you out of office. So I think that would hopefully uh, lead to a lot more political accountability than we have right now. Yes, ma'am. So similar along the vein of like, these concerns about inadequate remedy, in the aftermath of Celia Law and Collins, we've seen hundreds of cases levied against largely the Social Security Administration for the independence of that commissioner. And courts have been inclined to acknowledge the unconstitutional removal protections, but then dismiss the case because there's not a remedy, right? They say that it's not connected to an individual denial of benefits, so there's no case here. So my question is, how do we substantively combat the administrative state when courts will agree on the unconstitutional element, but there almost seems like no remedy in these cases? That is certainly a problem, and just getting into court is often a problem. People are found to have no standing, or uh, that even if it was uh, an unconstitutional procedure, no harm, no foul, because they uh, uh, they would be really lost anyway. So, so getting into court is a problem, but I, I think persistence does pay off. We've had a number of cases where we were involved uh, 
uh, on behalf of uh, disability benefits for SSI benefits who were not able to get into court because of, of uh, various problems. The Supreme Court just last year opened the window a little bit more to allow that, and I'm hopeful that uh, um, in the near future um, that there will be a court that will look at the merits of it. And in fact, there are more ALJs within the Social Security Administration by far than any other federal agency, so that is the perhaps the number one place to look. And after the sale law decision came out, going forward, I, my understanding is that HHS changed the way that, that uh, uh, ALJs were appointed and the way they operate to take care of, of uh, the constitutional deficiencies that existed before, so that really existing cases are much more focused on decisions that were issued before that change in policy. So things have improved, I think, in that. But it, you're, the issue you point out is a problem, you're right. Yes, ma'am. So, sir, you discussed the various cases uh, that AIR has been involved in, and there are some wins, and there are some losses. And the losses seem to be to turn on a relatively narrow margin, nine to seven. Happen. Are you identifying some trends that things are starting to shift? I mean, even though there are losses, are you starting to see momentum coming with the wins? Or, you know, how, how do you read the tea leaves on any of these decisions? I read the tea leaves by changes in the composition of the Supreme Court, and it has changed quite a bit for the last couple of years. And I would say that Justice Thomas, for a while, was kind of a lonely voice uh, speaking up against. Uh, the problems in the administrative state. I think Justice Gorsuch has joined in quite a bit recently, and that with the addition of uh, uh, Justice uh, Barrett and, and Justice Kavanaugh, the uh, atmosphere in the Supreme Court is a lot better. So, uh, you know, for example, the Supreme Court has not upheld a law on the basis of Chevron deference in about five years, and. That would be a great news, except for the fact that lower courts every day are upholding uh, uh, regulations on the basis of Chevron deference. So it takes a while for the, the news to sink in. But I think, at least at the Supreme Court, the trend is very much in the right direction. Yes, Frank. Thanks for all you're doing. And NCLA, thanks very much for all these efforts. Um, I just had a question you know, the agencies, when they take at their discretion, you know, make, clarify or, or write the regulations at their level. Can they actually put in like fines and jail time stipulations into these things that then they, they can enforce? They certainly try to all the time. I mean, there's some question about that. And as I said, there is uh, uh, a considerable authority that agencies have no right to uh, to interpret uh, criminal statutes that are ambiguous, that instead the opposite rule should apply there. So that uh, there have been a number of cases in which the Supreme Court has said uh, the effort of an agency to create a new crime uh, was not valid because uh, to the extent that the statute that they were relying on was unclear, the result is that we should not uh, uh, recognize the new crime, but rather we should, we should hold it. Uh, uh, it's not a crime. The Supreme Court just about three weeks ago in a, uh, a case involving something called the Armed Career Criminal uh, Statute uh, unanimously said that uh, the effort of, of the Justice Department to create new crimes uh, in that, under that particular statute not for this one. Yes, sir. Um, I will confess up the front, I was a 12 or 13 year bureaucrat, so I want to one of these agencies. How much do you think some of the problems that come out are the fact that most people, the vast majority of people who work in these agencies, especially in Washington, D.C., generally occupy with political thought and not there's not a balance? I'm sorry. Not <laughs> I mean, there's not a balance. They're mostly Democrats who work for these agencies. Oh, well, 90%, especially here in Washington. You get outside of D.C., it's a little different, but 
It's mostly here in Washington headquarters. You're talking about overwhelming <laughs> one political mindset. How would you think that's a problem with what's going on? Yeah, I think it's a problem. And I think if you, regardless of what your political views were when you join an agency, I think the tendency is to think that the agency you work for is a good one and has good solutions, and therefore we ought to expand the power of our agency. Plus, if we can get a bigger budget for next year, that means more employees uh, uh, who work underneath me. So, yeah, that's a serious problem, and that's all the more reason why courts need to step in to uh, make sure that, uh, uh, that the bureaucracy is, is not uh, uh, trying to expand the, the laws that Congress passed. I think I probably have the time for about one more question. So, <coughs> why don't you, well, I'll have two, if you had to. Okay. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that the IRS tax code was written by Congress and not by an agency. I found that hard to believe that they come up with that kind of detail. I mean, some people say that the IRS still writes too many regulations that, that try to interpret the, the code. But if you look at the federal tax code, it's this big, and it, the laws are far more uh, detailed. The, the Federal Trade Commission, the, the entire laws uh, governing the Federal Trade Commission are about four pages long. And so, uh, I cite the example of the IRS only because, uh, to me, that disproves the notion that uh, that Congress is incapable, if it wants to, of providing a lot of detail to the law, and instead is forced in this uh, modern age to turn over the, the detail writing to um, uh, EP. Now, of course, Congress, if, if you're trying to limit the amount of of uh, pollutants that can be put into the air in any given city in order to keep the air clean. Those sorts of detailed numbers, Congress isn't in a position to write, but it can write a statute that says, here is how EPA is to go about doing it, and it can provide a lot more detail than it does under current law, which is you, you need to, to set pollution levels at a level to make sure that the air is safe. I mean, that, that is not the kind of, of, of detail that uh, I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so I've, I've seen some commentary in recent years that some of these independent agencies are unconstitutional. And the one that uh, seems to get mentioned the most is the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, the CFPB. Uh, do you have a, any thoughts on whether it is actually unconstitutional? And if, if so, is there a way some point down the road to actually you know, to get rid of these independent agencies because they're being to be unconstitutional. Well, the Supreme Court, in a decision called Sale of Law two years ago, held that it was unconstitutional. And <clears throat> the result was some of the people who were arguing for the plaintiff said, okay, the result is you should just strike down the whole law. The Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to go that far. All we're going to do is to excise from the law the one provision that said that the uh, 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 director of the bureau should be independent and could serve a term uh, and, and could not be fired by the president except for a good cause, which usually means he's committed a crime or you know, done something really bad. So the agency is still there, but it is now, unlike the way it was um, uh, first adopted is now fully answerable to the president in the same way that any other department of the, of the federal government is. Now, <clears throat> there may be people who have other problems with the way the agency is structured. I'm not aware of, of those challenges, but, but certainly the sale of law decision demonstrates that uh, if you don't like the way an agency is set up, there are uh, there is recourse in the courts, and so so I guess I will end with that. That there is a, a silver lining to the administrative state and the way things have been going, and that things are looking up in the Supreme Court. And I appreciate your taking the time to listen to me today. And um, let me just advance the slide to the very last thing, which has my contact information. So that if anybody does have ideas of uh, ways that they would like to take on the administrative state. We're a nonprofit group and we're always looking 
uh, for uh, new ideas to uh, uh, challenge what is going on. So, so uh, please let us know. So thank you very much.